I'm very happy to introduce and welcome our very first keynote speaker of this conference. Uh, Dr. Jan Sung Hang is a well productive assistant professor at Wayne State University in the US. He is also an adjunct assistant professor at San Kwan Kwan University in Seoul, in South Korea. And for the past several years, Dr. Hang has primarily conducted research on factors associated with bias based bullying and peer victimization of racial and ethnic minority, immigrant, LGBTQ, uh, gender norm conforming, uh, juvenile justice involving impoverished adolescents and young adults in the US and in South Korea. He has also collaborated with researchers in South Korea, Taiwan, Sweden, and in UK on bullying and peer victimization. Uh, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Thornburg, for that lovely introduction. It is a great pleasure to be here today. Um, this is my first time in Sweden, so I was very excited. But at the same time, you know, I was wondering, like, you know, what does Sweden look like? And I got a chance to see it, and it's just gorgeous. Okay. Before I begin my talk, um, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for your attendance. Your attendance makes a huge difference. And I'd like to thank the International Bullying Prevention Association for the work that they have been doing and in making difference in the lives of children and adolescents from all over the world. And to the researchers, many of you out there who have been doing groundbreaking research, such as Dr. Olvius, Dr. Peter Smith, Dr. Espelage, Dr. Pepler, Rivers, Thornburg, Hunter, Rigby. Uh, there are so many of you out there, Dr. Hindua. And the research that you have been doing has made a tremendous difference. And personally speaking, as an um, early career um, professional or early career researcher, I have um, cited your work extensively, and I have a lot of admiration for your work. I just never thought that I'd be out here talking about it in front of you. So, so I will begin my presentation. So my keynote speech, so as you can see, um, the title is an exploration of homophobic bullying within multiple contexts and application of the ecological systems framework. So that is the title of my talk. Well, when I was doing some research, when I was looking into articles, when I was looking at um, you know, newspaper clippings as well as news headlines, um, I recall one that really caught my eye. And the headline reads, when words kill, that is so gay. I wanted to ask um, you, how many of you have heard or um, heard the phrase, that's so gay from your friends, your peers, anyone? Virtually all of you raised your hand and you probably hear that even today, thinking that it's probably not that harmful. But unfortunately for some youth, it is quite harmful and deadly, and words do kill. Take a look at um, the statement made by the mother of an 11-year-old Carl Joseph Walker Hoover in the US who committed suicide. This is what she said. I am brokenhearted. We worry about the economy, but we need to worry about our schools, which is so true. This is a sentiment that's echoed by just about every mother who lost their child because of bullying or homophobic bullying. She also says, bullies were worse than the breast cancer I had survived four years ago. Powerful statement, right? And that really had a profound e effect on me and I wanted to share that with you. So her son, Carl Joseph Walker Hoover, committed suicide only at the age of 11. I want to show you a video clip, um, one of many cases about bully teen who committed suicide. An Ottawa teen's suicide is putting the spotlight back on school bullying and depression. His family is now trying to send a message to other teens struggling with these issues. Andrew Nichols has the details. Andrew. 
and Carol, uh, Jamie Hubley, uh, 15 years old from Canada, Ontario, is actually the son of a Canada, Ontario uh, uh, city councillor. He did commit suicide on uh, Friday. This is a, a video of him. You can see the, there he was singing. Uh, he was known to be uh, an aspiring singer, a pretty good singer too. Uh, he was gay and out, and he was bullied at school because of his sexual orientation. And he wrote about his feelings uh, on a number of social networking sites. Here's just a couple of those postings. He says, I hate being the only gay guy in my school. I really want to end it. I'm tired of life, really. It's so hard. I'm sorry. I can't take it anymore. Now, Jamie's uh, father, Alan Hubley, uh, had this to say about his son. He says he was a championship figure skater for years and was just beginning to excel as a singer. Uh, Jamie's family and friends unconditionally supported and accepted him for who he was and whatever direction he wanted to go in life. Jamie asked a question no child should have to ask, why do people say mean things to me? And uh, Alan Hubley Carroll also talked about how his son tried to start up a rainbow club at the school, which would be a club that would welcome gay and lesbian students, but the posters advertising that club were torn down, and on a number of occasions, uh, uh, Jamie, um, students at his school um, slung a homophobic slur at him, the, the worst one you can think of, at him. And so uh, he was taunted and um, traumatized by all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, children at that age are so vulnerable. Uh, sometimes parents try to help, but they can't always deal with what's going on out there in the big bad world. However, yeah. other people are trying to do things for teens who feel bullied in this way. You're right, and the family did issue a long statement saying that they really did try and help, that they were very open, that they were very supportive of him, but that Jamie did suffer from depression and that he was taking some medication for it. But there is definitely a concern, Carol, about teen suicide, especially gay and lesbian teen suicide, because it's just way out of whack. It's very disproportionate in terms of non-gay teen, sui teen suicide. So it's very high, disturbingly high. And so there was a campaign that was started uh, last year, in the past little while, called It Gets Better, where celebrities come, who are mostly gay, who come and talk about uh, life as an adult and how it does get better. Rick Mercer is one of those celebrities. Have a listen. I can remember, you know, in grade three being gay. I mean, I certainly was, you know, in my, in the, in the, uh, in the school photograph, everyone is looking forward and I'm like gazing across the way at this guy over there, who I won't say his name because he would find that embarrassing. Unfortunately, uh, Carol and uh, Jamie just didn't believe that it does get better. In fact, he, he made reference to this campaign in one of his postings saying three more years. That would be when he would be 18 years old. Uh, this hurts too much. How do you even know? And when he would be out of high school. How do you even know it will get better? It's not. So just another sad story today about um, a gay teenager taking his own life. Homophobic bullying, this is a public health concern. This is a global concern. This is a concern not just confined to one area, one nation, one place, but in many, many places. In fact, this is recognized as a global concern as indicated in the statement made by the UN Secretary General, who stated, homophobic bullying is a moral outrage, a grave violation of human rights, and a public health concern, and he is so correct. This is a statement made by the UN Secretary General. What are adolescents telling us? This is what they're saying. Here's one statement. I'm 14 in March, and I'm being bullied constantly. In nearly every class, I sit by myself because nobody wants to sit next to me. One of my few friends hangs around with other people, because I think he is frightened. If he is with me, he will get bullied. I'm sick to death, and sometimes I feel like killing myself. This is what kids are telling us. Another student said, I was attacked at school with a large tree branch across the face. People would walk right up to me in the canteen and punch me in the face. People would follow me around and throw their lunch or drink at me. One of them cut my long hair in class, and it lit it on fire. So these are the statements made by victims of bullying. And the second one was made by a victim of homophobic bullying. And here's one that ended in tragedy. 
I remember reading this um, when I was going through research, and I remember reading this um, excerpt. I shall remember forever and will never forget. Monday, my money was taken. Tuesday, names called. Wednesday, my uniform torn. Thursday, my body pouring with blood. Friday, it's ended. Saturday, freedom, and he hung himself on Sunday. So, as we can see, bullying does have serious consequences, and kids are relying on us to make a difference. Now I want to give you an overview of homophobic bullying, which is one of many types of bullying. So over the years, there's been a number of groundbreaking research conducted on homophobic bullying by Dr. Espelage, Dr. Ian Rivers, Dr. Poteet, et cetera. And many researchers have defined homophobic bullying as bullying behavior motivated by prejudice against an individual's actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity. Remember, actual or perceived. So you don't have to be gay, bisexual, lesbian, etc., to be homophobically bullied. You can be perceived as one. This typically occurs in secret or in secrecy because many youth who are homophobically bullied, whether they're gay or not, are afraid to be singled out from the norm. So if I report it, then people are going to think I'm abnormal. Or they're afraid to be at risk of being outed or re-victimized by an adult. If I tell a teacher, then maybe the teacher will you know, treat me differently. Okay? Here's a statement. I can't tell anyone because basically no one knows that I am gay. I got punched in the corridor today, for example, and I can't tell the teachers because it will involve coming out. So this statement verifies that you know, this typically occurs in secret. Excuse me. Take a look at rate of homophobic bullying worldwide. So this is a global concern and affects um, you know, children and adolescents from various parts of the world. Okay? Um, the rates vary. But if you look at like Australia, as many as 80% of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer identified students report that school is the most likely place abuse or homophobic bullying abuse type of abuse occurs. In Japan, as many as 83% of gay or bisexuals report that they are bullied in the school. At UK, as many as 97% report verbal abuse, 41% physical abuse, and 17% death threat. In Canada, as many as 74% transgender, 50% of LGBT students report verbal harassment. And some of these countries are known to be tolerant and, op you know, tolerant and accepting of LGBTQ, but we still see things like homophobic bullying occurring. Okay? Now, forgive me, I was unable to find the prevalence rate for Sweden, and I was trying very hard. But I know that homophobic bullying is a serious issue in Sweden as well. Okay? Here are the stories of students who actually took their lives. So in 2010, a young man named Tyler Clementi, a university student, committed suicide after his roommate secretly recorded him with another man. So the roommate, he took a video camera and he recorded it and he showed that to other people, like other people in the storm. Next day, this young man said, okay, bye, and then he committed suicide by jumping off the bridge. I remember this case because I was a student. In 2011, um, as we saw in the earlier clip, Jamie Hubley, so he was in Canada, son of an Ottawa city councillor, committed suicide because he was, or he had been enduring homophobic bullying which started in grade seven. In 2013, a young um, girl in Southeast London was found dead after suffering from homophobic bullying. So homophobic bullying is quite deadly. Here are the more recent events. In 2016, a young man named Tyrone Unsworth in Australia killed himself after years of enduring homophobic bullying. His school says, we didn't know anything about it. But his parents say, uh, we're not sure about that. In 2017, 
a young transgender um, named Dominique Rain Camacho hung, um, hung herself after bullying. She happened to live in a traditionally conservative Christian community where her transgender identity was not accepted and was condemned. So these are the stories of these young people whose lives were taken at such a young age. These young people should be fulfilling their dreams, living out their dreams, making a contribution to society, but unfortunately, their life was cut short because of words such as, that's so gay, you're a fag, you don't deserve to live, etc. Well, studies have shown that lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and um, queer or questioning youth are far more likely to be bullied than heterosexual youth, which is not surprising. And the percentage of gay youth who are bullied is two to three times higher than that of heterosexual youth. Homophobic bullying affects anyone of any age. It could be as young as eight or seven, or it could be as old as 20, 30, or even 40. If you look at these images, you see that these are young men who committed suicide due to homophobic bullying. And you can see that some of them are very young, right? The one on the very left, um, he is, I believe he was about 10 or 11 when he committed suicide. Homophobic bullying. So homophobic bullies, those who target others because of actual or perceived sexual orientation, they target those who are, quote unquote, self-identified as LGBTQ or perceived as one. They also target those who don't confirm, conform to gender norm, have the same sex parents or caregivers, or are LGBTQ parents, coaches, teachers, community uh, members, etc. Now, if you look at the third one, don't conform to gender norm, how many of you remember an incident in the US that occurred um, called the Columbine High School shooting? So many of you have heard of that case, right? So there were two shooters, and it was discovered that the two shooters were targeted you know, because they did not conform to the quote-unquote gender norm, because they didn't play football, because they're outsiders. And I remember like shortly after the incident, one football player, one football player was interviewed, you know, um, one football player who attended Columbine was interviewed, and he said, you know, yeah, sure, we teased them, it's because they're weird. They're a bunch of homos. Nobody wanted them you know, at our school. So that's a good example of those who don't conform to gender norm. Okay. So how can homophobic bullying be displayed? It could be displayed in many ways. Verbally, being called, you're a fag. Being socially excluded, which is very common. Cyberbullying, which is a very um, common you know, phenomenon as well. Physically, being compared to LGBT celebrities or a caricature, or being outed even if you're not. And also, sexual harassment. Homophobic language is a very important component of homophobic bullying. And the common reaction to homophobic language is, it wasn't meant to be harmful. We didn't mean no harm. It was a joke, but it's used very frequently without thinking. We use phrases like, ah, oh, don't be a fag, faggot, that's so gay, dyke, no homo, stop acting like a homo. We use phrases like that thinking there's no harm, but for some you know, youth, it can be very detrimental to their physical and mental health. In fact, according to the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, they report that as many as 90% of middle school students heard classmates called gay in a derogatory manner. Stop being gay, you know, that's an example. 63% heard the school staff making negative comments, and less than 20% reported staff intervening. So when they hear phrases like, that's so gay, staff really, less than 20% of staff actually did something. In fact, when I was researching homophobic um, language, I actually came across a um, web page called nohomophobes.com. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Okay, so actually when I opened that, um, 
what it has are, you know, list of like homophobic terms like faggot, no homo, so gay, and dyke, and the number of tweets that have these phrases. Now, I got to tell you, I'm probably one of the very few people who has never or who rarely uses tweets. So I don't know much about tweets. But so when I opened this web page in May 2nd, you know, 2017, around 1045, so when I saw the word faggot, around 1045, there were about 3,460 comments. Then every minute it keeps going up by one, by two, by 10, by 20, et cetera. And by 1052, there were as many as 3,518 tw um, tweets that has the phrase faggot, okay? Now I wanted to talk about the ecological system theory and how that's related and how that's important to our research and our practice. So this framework, was developed by a renowned um, child psychologist named Uri Bronfenbrenner, who argued that human behavior and development are in influenced by different types of environmental systems. This is very useful for understanding and assessing the correlates and predictors of homophobic bullying, bullying, etc. And personally speaking, it's very important for my research as well. So many past studies or past research have identified individual characteristics that are associated with bullying and victimization, like gender difference, sex difference, behavioral health, et cetera. But researchers have also recognized the importance of assessing various contexts and how that can influence you know, bullying behavior or homophobic bullying behavior. And these contexts can be within the family, peer, teacher, school, and community levels. Okay? And certain environmental factors have both direct or have direct or indirect effect on homophobic bullying. So um, basically, in a nutshell, um, the ecological system theory presents domains of variable, but it doesn't focus specifically on which variables are most important. They're all equally important, whether it's micro, the most proximal, and macro, the most distal level. And also, this um, framework states that environmental and policy influences, the macro level influences are just as important and they are the hallmark of the ecological model. In fact, in research on bullying and um, homophobic bullying, the interest in ecological model is very strong because bullying occurs in not just in one context, but in many contexts, at the home, at school mostly, and possibly in the neighborhood. Also, um, with regards to the ecological systems framework, this is the interrelations between among individual and his or her environments. And as you can see, it's broken down into the microsystem, mesosystem, exosystem, and macrosystem, which I'll kind of explain a little bit more you know, in details. Although the concentric circle is used to depict the ecological model, I thought this, would also, this is also a good depiction as well, okay? So there's four levels from the microsystem, mesosystem, exo, and macro. So at the microsystem, this is the um, direct level influences, like the home, um, school, and the neighborhood. Whereas the mesosystem is the interrelations between two or more microsystems, one affecting the other. For example, if a child um, observes aggressive behavior among his or her parents in the home, that's one microsystem, then that can affect his interactions with his peers in school. That's another microsystem. Uh, yes, so there's two or more um, microsystems that affect one another, so that's what mesosystem is. And then comes the exosystem, which is where, you know, there are external, you know, factors that doesn't directly affect the individual child, but can um, influence the microsystem of the child. For example, a child whose parents, ha um, whose parents spends most of his or her time working, that can affect um, the parent's, you know, the parent's relationship with the child. So that is a good example of an exosystem. And then the macrosystem is like culture, gender, you know, such as gender role, policy, etc. Okay. So how is this relevant to homophobic bullying? So these are what studies have reported in terms of sex, biological sex, 
Studies have found that gay males are at higher risk of bullying than their lesbian or heterosexual counterparts. Other studies find that boys are more likely to be involved in homophobic bullying, but they're less likely to befriend an LGBTQ student. In terms of sexual orientation, homophobic bullying is not just limited to LGBTQ youth, but also youth in the general population who are perceived as one. In fact, there's a two groundbreaking studies by Dr. Espelage, which found that questioning adolescents, those who question their sexual orientation, those who do not know or they're uncertain of their sexual orientation, report more homophobic bullying than straight or gay students. And they're also less likely to receive social support in school. In terms of microsystem, studies have found that positive relations with family, peers, and teachers, as well as school, are very important and can, provo um, can promote social connectedness, which can you know, underpin successful integration of sexual minority identity. So also, social support from parents, peers, and teachers are very important. This is a very important protective factor. And for those of you who are practitioners or counselors working with students, this is very important. And this is something that you need to target. However, not surprisingly, Homophobic peer in the school setting. So that's another microsystem. And studies have found that those attending schools with homophobic peers, that can increase the risk of enduring homophobic bullying. In many countries, including Sweden, US, etc., schools have become increasingly diverse. Of course, they, they're much more diverse than when I was a student a long time ago. And although schools are increasingly diverse and Adolescents are more open and tolerant towards you know, LGBTQ than in the past. Inhospitality and prejudice is still pervasive. Another important protective factor is um, teacher or school staff involvement. This is, um, studies have found that teachers can make a difference and their involvement can make a world of difference to adolescents. And studies find that it's negatively um, related to homophobic bullying victimization. Okay, and here are two studies, uh, here's one study that supports that. So one study had a sample of 59 gender and transgender students, and they found that, you know, these students are less likely to be victimized or report victimized, or f and are more likely to feel safer in school when teachers actively take measures. How many of you here are teachers? you can make a world of difference, okay? Well, another study in Irish secondary school report that 87% of teachers have witnessed homophobic bullying, and about as many as 41% find it difficult to address it, and the majority report barriers to intervening, okay? At the mesosystem level, studies have found that, for example, lack of social support, that's one microsystem, can increase the likelihood of homophobic peers, another microsystem. So students in schools with lack of support are likely to hear homophobic remarks by peers. Okay? So I'm gonna um, skip right ahead to the macro system. Um, in terms of macro system, which is the, um, the distal level factor, Studies have found that, for example, the availability of LGBTQ resource center is very significant, and schools that have that are likely, to have are likely to have students who are less likely to report homophobic bullying or experiencing homophobic bullying. And if you look at here, availability of LGBTQ resource center, that does reflect the attitudes and behavior or beliefs of the environment. So this can, in a sense, be a macro um, level factor. Okay. Um, one study also found, as I mentioned, that those who perceive resource centers feel safer and are less likely to report homophobic bullying. So this is very important. So if you're a teacher or if you're a school administrator, and if your school doesn't have some sort of resource center, I strongly encourage you to start one because this is a very important protective factor. What about heteronormativity? This tends to be culturally prescribed and can shape adolescents' peer relations and interactions. So schools, especially at conservative schools, where heterosexuality is normalized and homosexuality is condemned, are more likely to have students 
who experience homophobic bullying because of their actual perceived um, sexual minority status or their quote unquote inadequate gender performance. Okay. So homophobic bullying as a way of enforcing heteronormativity does affect everyone. And youth who are non-conventional in their manners and appearance are more likely to experience peer victimization. Well, I wanted to share with you one of my studies that I conducted um, a couple of years ago, or actually in two, uh, it was published in 2016, but we started in about 2014 or 15. So what we looked at was past research has focused on more blatant types or forms of homophobic victimization, such as verbal threats, physical threat, and physical violence, when in fact LGBTQ youth or youth who are perceived as gay, they're likely to experience you know, various forms of homophobic victimization such as like everyday verbal abuse, physical abuse, avoidance from peers, and interpersonal microaggressions, such as like hearing the phrase like, you know, that's so gay. So we wanted to look at, um, so what we wanted to do was that we wanted to look at the correlates of these four types of homophobic victimization, okay? So the sample for our study was actually not high school students, but college students. So there were about 530. And they were recruited from you know, students attending like LGBTQ student conference as well as like online LGBTQ network. Okay. So in a nutshell, this is what we found at the micro. Um, one thing I should mention is, is that you know, all the coral, um, covariates have been found to be significant like you know, sex, um, race, et cetera. In addition, we found that like hearing homophobic remarks is positively related to interpersonal microaggression avoidance behavior and verbal threats, so three types of homophobic bullying. At the mesosystem level, we found that perceived LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer support actually buffered the effect of hearing homophobic remarks on the three types of homophobic bullying. At the macro system, we found that students who report that their campus have anti-discrimination policy, which is another important macro level factor, are less likely to experience verbal threat. In, ad in addition, excuse me. Um, in addition, poly victimization is also a reality for many LGBTQ students. So, in reality, LGBTQ youth are also at an increased risk of more than one forms of victimization in various settings, such as home, school, neighborhood, and broader society. Actually, there's a phenomenon. How many of you have heard of um, something called poly victimization? Okay, not very many people. Well, this is, you know, um, a type of victimization where you, um, you're likely to experience like five or more different forms of victimization within the past year. Okay? Take a look at this case example. Okay? So a 14-year-old named Keith is a middle school student who identifies as gay. He lives in a small conservative community and attends a church where gays are condemned. At home, his father frequently makes homophobic remarks when they watch TV. At his school, his classmates and teachers also frequently use his phrases like, that's so gay. And when it was discovered that he was gay, his father beat him and wouldn't speak to him. His former friends would taunt him, his so-called friends, and socially exclude him from their circle. His teachers berate him, and on his way home, he was approached by a group of youth in his neighborhood where they hurled homophobic insults and they ganged up on him. You can see that this young man is victimized in multiple settings, right? In the home, school, by his peers and teachers, as well as in the neighborhood. Here's a second study conducted by my, um, my colleagues and I. So we actually looked at the prevalence of maltreatment and homophobic victimization, and we wanted to explore whether that is a potential mediator. Okay, whether, I'm sorry, whether psychological distress is a potential mediator from a community-based sample of 125 LGBTQ-identified youth. Okay, and this is U.S.-based. So we found that as many as 46% of, of LGBTQ-identified youth experience childhood emotional abuse, 34% um, experience like physical abuse, 32% sexual abuse, and 28% emotional abuse. And we find that higher level of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse 
increase the risk of homophobic victimization. So adolescents who are victim um, who, uh, who are LGBTQ identified are likely to, to likely to experience maltreatment at home, various forms of maltreatment, as well as homophobic victimization. And we also found that psychological distress actually mediated that association between maltreatment and victimization. Okay. So that's the summary. So what are the next steps? Okay. Well, the good news is policymakers have recognized, at least in the US, policymakers have recognized the importance of bullying prevention. Okay? And over the years, policymakers have put anti-bullying policies in place. Now, this is an international audience, so I wanted to ask you, um, how many of you live in a country where there is a um, policy, you know, anti-bullying policy at a large scale? Okay, that's good news, which indicates that, you know, bullying is being taken seriously in many countries, okay? If you look at here, um, U.S. Department of Education in the U.S., they urge schools to proactively identify and prevent bias-based bullying. For example, Title IX um, prohibits discrimination based on gender or sexual orientation. Title II protects individuals with disability, and Title IV prohibits harassment based on religion or ethnicity. And also, the UNESCO, they actually had the first international consultation meeting to address homophobic bullying with various like organizations like NGOs, ministries of education, academia from more than 25 countries. So bullying and homophobic bullying are becoming, you know, are recognized by policymakers. That's a good news. Well, unfortunately, bias-based bullying continues to be a serious issue, even though many countries have some sort of anti-bullying um, policy in place. Because in case of homophobic bullying, it does persist and can go unnoticed or even endorsed by teachers, school administrators, um, and parents. Now, there was one qualitative study which surveyed or which um, was conducted with teachers, students, and parents regarding um, bias-based bullying. And these are the statements made by teachers, students, as well as parents. One teacher says, to be gay is to be different, and difference is treated with suspicion. One student also stated, if you're not gay, you don't want to be called gay, you don't want to be called gay. They, the students, would look on it as not normal. Um, another student stated, bullying goes on all the time. Anyone who is a bit different will get called names, especially if they are a bit feminine, maybe in their voice, okay? And then um, a parent stated, the ones who got bullied are those who don't have strong characters or outsiders. Those who are different, they're the ones who are bullied. And another student says, gay students would probably have a hard time around here. A few people would have problems with it because it is different, not normal. So calling someone a faggot is if they are not like a guy. Okay? Now, I want to kind of illustrate two exa um, an example of how policies have not worked very well, at least in the U.S., okay? In the state of Ohio in the Midwest, okay, there were several cases of bully side where bully victims committed suicide. That actually gained the attentions of politicians in Ohio, and they actually developed an anti-bullying and anti-harassment policy in 2004. In 2011, there were four students, four teens, in one high school who committed um, suicide. So these are four kids in one school who committed suicide because they were, you know, targeted and um, for, you know, their actual or perceived sexual orientation. Here's one study which was actually written for a report conducted by myself and my colleague um, two years ago. Well, in the state of Michigan, which is... Um, not far from Ohio, very close to Ohio. Michigan is probably one of the very few or very least progressive states when it comes to bullying prevention. But finally, they became the 48th state to have, you know, a anti-bullying policy, which requires schools to develop or implement, you know, anti-bullying policy. Okay. So what we did was my colleagues and I wanted to see whether these policies are working very well. 
So what we did was we gathered data from a sample of um, adolescents in Michigan schools who participated in an online survey. So this is across you know, the entire state. Unfortunately, you know, we didn't have a large sample, but we did find some a few things that were interesting. So it was about 200 students, but they revealed that 50% say that bullying is still a problem in their school. 75% say that they are aware of or have witnessed bullying. As many as 60% say that bullying has not decreased. And almost 80% felt that bullying is not a problem for kids. And about 50% stated that anti-bullying program or policy in school was strictly enforced. So this was written, this is, you know, a report written for the Michigan, you know, Board of Education. Okay, so this was about two years ago. Now I wanted to show you what kids are saying. Oh, excuse me. All this week, all this week, we're partnering with uh, People Magazine, taking an in-depth look at bull bull bullying. We're calling our coverage "Bullying No Escape" because what a lot of people forget is that these days, for kids who are bullied, there's often no escape in the sense that it's it's not just happening in our schools; it's online, it's on cell phones, on mobile devices, and kids are dying because of it. I sat down with eight teens recently, middle and high school kids, to find out about their firsthand experiences with with bullying. Listen. So who here has either been bullied or seen somebody else being bullied in your school? Raise your hand. All of you. Yeah. How many of you have actually been bullied? So nearly all of you. How, how about you for you? How did, what kind of bullying did you get? Um, I came out of the closet as gay in eighth grade and um, ever since I've been bullied, I was, for lack of a better word, and still am, the school faggot. Um, People call you that. People every use day. the F word. Too. Every day. Um, every single day. Every, uh, probably about, give or take, 10, 12 times a day. Um, there was a point where a kid had a knife on school premises and said, I'm going to kill him. I want that faggot dead. And I had to transfer schools. Um, how about you? you? you you've been bullied as well. But I've been verbally abused because of my religion. I'm a Muslim girl, and it's really hard living in a small town where everyone seems to be an Italian Catholic or Christian. And when you say Muslim, it's like you see their faces drop. It's like no one knows what that is, or they're scared of it. And it's been hard. Like, I will, people won't talk to me anymore once they find out. Jason, how about you? Um, I was bullied on a regular day basis from like April of last year to like the end of the school year. One day, he just, I didn't even see him coming. He just came out of nowhere and hit me. But he would probably just be calling me names and, like, hitting me, I guess. What kind of names? Oh, like, uh, faggot, emo, gay, stuff like that. All because I would probably, all because I was smarter than him or the music that I listened to. Just pretty much if I was different from him, he would find a name to call me that was related to the difference and just call me that name, so. It, it seems like that's pretty much, what, those are those names are kind of the most common names that bullies will call guys. I mean, they'll use the F word. Um, is that is that pretty much everyone's experience here? Yeah. 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 Well, when you hear about kids who have committed suicide, who have killed themselves because of bullying, does it surprise you? Not at all. Not really. No. It doesn't surprise no. you? No. no. Because it makes me realize how really serious bullying is because some people might think that bullying really isn't that big but deal. it really is because anything that causes kids to really kill themselves has to be a big problem and it needs to be stopped but because when adult i mean i think when a lot when i hear about it when adults hear about kids you know an 11 year old kid who kills himself who hangs himself it's it's shocking but it, i mean it's interesting that all of you say it, you're not surprised by it uh, i think that bullying when you experience it you feel so helpless and day in and day out you're being called something and, and they're telling you the same message. Your life is worthless. 
Takes and you start, yeah. Yeah. You, you yeah. start to believe it. You yeah. do, and, and I, I believed it for a long time. I believed that I did not deserve to live. Death is the only escape. Because if you kill yourself, it's done. You don't have to do it anymore. Do you think part of the reason some people bully is that they're afraid that if they don't, they're going to get targeted? Yeah. I think pressure has yeah. a lot to yeah. do with it. Do you rather it happen to someone else than yourself? Themselves, I mean. So you do it to someone else so it doesn't happen to you? A lot of people do. Is there fear in, you know, talking to people in school, talking to social workers or talking to teachers or talking to the principal? Is there fear in, in doing that, that it's, it's just going to make the situation worse? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How so? You could, you could just get called a snitch, you know, and just, oh, look at the stupid snitch, and then you'll just get teased more. It can actually make it worse. Yeah. And you guys don't think adults these days really have a conception of how bad it is? No. no. Generally, they really. don't no. take it seriously enough because what could eventually happen is quite possibly suicide. And if an adult is one of those bystanders that just chose not to do anything on that particular day, and that kid goes home and commits suicide, essentially their blood is on your hands. Well, let me just play devil's advocate. I mean, this is, bullying is something that's been around for generations, forever probably. Is it something that can really be, be changed? I hear that argument a lot, and people say, bullying can't be changed. It's been around forever. But it really can. And how many people deep down inside have empathy, have uh, that consideration that if you can really get down into their soul and make them understand the way that the words... Um, affect people, then they can change. Sorry about the um, brief technical difficulty. Okay. Well, according to the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, they state that there needs to be measures for improving school climate for all students. As you saw in the video clip, you see that you know each student has a story to tell. And they are probably, you know, they're pro one thing they have in common, it seems, is that they are victims of what's called bias-based bullying, which indicates that although any student, any child can be affected by bullying or any child can be a victim of bullying, bullying is not always an equal opportunity act. Some kids are more likely to be bullied or run the risk of being, you know, bully victims more so than others. And one of them is LGBTQ students, okay? And I just want to share with you, you know, I had my um, share of experiences in, you know, bias-based bullying because, you know, English is not my second language. So kids, I remember kids would make fun of me because of that. But anyways, so um, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, they said that there needs to be measures for improving um, school climate for all students by increasing investment in improving the conditions of learning in school. One way to do it at the microsystem level is creating um, is to create a safe school environment, which is very important. And we need to have you know some new assessment tools to look at full spectrum of victimization experiences experienced or reported by LGBTQ adolescents. And as I mentioned earlier, victimization can um, can occur in the home, school, as well as you know in the community. It's also important to consider intervention strategies focusing on adolescent social emotional development. It's also important to consider programs that increase students' sense of empathy and willingness to intervene. In many cases, bystanders might just you know, watch and just walk away. But it's important to get students to actually you know, stand up against you know, bullies. Okay? It's also important to provide educators with training and preparation to increase support and affirmation for all students. And at the mesosystem level, um, it's important to consider other school settings and how that might affect the school climate, okay? One thing I wanted to say is that, you know, congruent and consistent messages delivered across context is important. And it's important, it's important for you to assess for the availability of social support outside the home, which is very important. In fact, studies have found that homeschool collaboration is very important and it's associated with positive outcomes, but in some cases, it might not be feasible for certain students. But it's also important for school officials never to ignore concerned parents whose ch child is bullied. And I wanted to share with you, 
Um, I do have students like at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, where I teach. I have adult students with kids who oftentimes come to me and say, June, I need help because my child is being bullied by other kids. And but the, when I report this to teachers or school officials, they do nothing. In fact, there's a case that actually ended in tragedy. In the state of Florida, in the state of Florida, there was a young 14-year-old um, student who was cyberbullied by um, her classmates. One boy actually said, you're fat, you're ugly, you don't deserve to live, so why don't you kill yourself? He actually posted that on her Facebook. So the mother of the girl was getting concerned and actually reported to the teachers and the school officials, but she was rebuffed. They said, well, this is you know really out of our hand. We can't do anything. One day, the mother and the uh, mother and the daughter were shopping at a mall. They actually spotted the boy. And the mother went up to the boy and put her um, hands on his neck and choked him. And she was charged with child abuse. Okay? Stories like that, you know, unfortunately are echoed by other parents as well. Because when I read the story and when I read the comments that followed, a lot of people said things like, you know, I totally understand the mother because I'm having the same problem. So if you're a teacher, you should never ignore, you know, a parent who comes to you and say, my child is bullying, what should I do? At the macro level, it's important to recognize that homophobic bullying is re reinforced through culture. And just because you have an anti-bullying policy doesn't mean that bullying is going to go away. So it's important to assess whether the existing policy adequately addresses bias-based bullying. And it's important to target school areas that might reinforce bias-based bullying and homophobic language because they're used frequently in certain areas in schools, like in the gym or in PE. Coaches might say, you know, come on, come on, don't act like a fag, you know, or at least in the U.S. And advancing best practices for bullying prevention requires the following, continuing dialogue and exchanging ideas, promoting positive school climates for all, and working together across multiple disciplines, which are the goals of the International Bullying Prevention Association. Well, I wanted to end by saying this. So I, you know, um, if you want to know what guides my research, I always follow this mantra that bullying prevention is social justice promotion. This is what guides my research. In my area, in, this, in the um, social work profession, we stress the importance of social justice for everyone, and that you know to have a socially to live in a socially just society, everyone deserves equal educational, economic, political, and social rights. But not everyone will get that because they're bullied, they're victimized, or you know because they're discriminated against. So it is our mission to advocate the rights and opportunities for all students, all students. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hong, for a very insightful, uh, content-rich, and important uh, presentation, uh, which really remind us of the importance of bringing uh, the issue of heteronormativity and uh, intersectionality into the research on school bullying as well as to the anti-bullying policy and, and practice. Thank you so much. Thank you. And as a um, small gift, uh, you mentioned at the start that you were really interested in Sweden. So as a small gift, we have a kind of, and this is a sign of our gratitude, a kind of a fine taste of Sweden, a fine taste of Stockholm. Thank you. Thank you.